God has called us to do some wonderful, wonderful things together as a family, hasn't he? Uh, very, very excited about this particular season and what we're bringing a focus and attention to the four weeks that we focused on through Advent and the four weeks that we're looking at from a very, very famous portion of Scripture. So I want to get right into that um, and just evaluate perspective number two of a very commonly understood verse. And I'm going to today attempt to dispel or maybe define more effectively a very common uh, Christianese phrase that we use that I think we need a little bit more of a complete perspective to really understand the heart of what God's wanting to reveal in that regard. So come on, let's just agree together. Father, I thank you for the power of your word that truly does transform our lives and not only our lives, but Lord has the power to transform entire societies and communities of people. And I pray, Lord, that we would understand that unto us, this child, this king has come, has been born to literally bring the kingdom of God into the earth. And we are the cooperative force with heaven. Help us to see that with clarity today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So this commonly known verse, unto us a child is born, we'll read through that in just a few moments, but I want you to understand something as we're evaluating the four perspectives that are revealed in the four Gospels of Jesus Christ. Why do we have four Gospels? And uh, they're unique in, uh, in and of themselves. And the book of Matthew, as we looked last week, reveals Jesus as our King. The book of Mark, which we'll look at this week, and we'll see these, these portions of Scripture. And by the way, the reason that it was just in my heart to do this, sometimes, how many of you have ever read a portion of Scripture and you just felt like, that is a very significant portion of Scripture for me personally. Have you ever done that? In my devotions this morning, I stumbled onto something, and I just thought, that is really significant for me. So what I do when I find a portion of Scripture that I feel like is maybe the Lord is highlighting for me, then I, I read it with pauses in different places. I'll, I'll rehearse it. I'll memorize it. Uh, I'll think about it in different perspectives and contexts just to try and get the picture maybe of what God's wanting to reveal. So we're going to see from four different angles a really vital portion of Scripture. Today we'll look at it from the standpoint of how Mark reveals Christ as the obedient servant. And then next week we'll see how Luke reveals Jesus as the Son of Man. And then the fourth week, Jesus the Son of God. The book of John reveals Jesus in that light. So it is interesting when we step into this to realize, guys, Jesus didn't come to establish a holiday where we could give gifts to each other. That wasn't the purpose that Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion in the earth. Jesus came literally to establish the kingdom of God that's being awakened in our hearts. My prayer, and as I've been asking the Lord this morning, uh, in these moments that we have together is that he really will awaken something of his kingdom in our hearts, illuminate something of his nature to help us walk out of here with a deposit from God. How many of you want a true deposit from God? A true deposit from God. And so I just encourage you to receive that deposit by actively engaging with what God desires to reveal. Uh, amen. Yes, so be it. Walk the dog, Bishop. You know, whatever it is, you just declare it. Awaken something. As I say, God is a God who delivers. And you say? Amen. Uh, I say, God is a God of salvation. And you and your house will be saved. Amen. We're believing for those things. And so what we do is we articulate, we put substance to the promises of God with our declaration. That's the way you got saved. You believed in your heart and you spoke with your mouth and heaven and earth began to align. And that's the way we're to continue to live in him. So we're going to see this from this standpoint today. Jesus, obedient servant. I want you to think about him as an obedient servant. As I read this portion of scripture, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, for unto us this child, this obedient servant Christ was born, and to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. Everyone say government. It's important that you see this, particularly next week. Uh, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his, there's that word again, government. God has a government. We need to understand it. And the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over, the, uh, over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So today, in trying to understand this prophecy 
that Jesus fulfilled coming not only as the king of kings that we looked at last week, but as the obedient servant to awaken the obedient servanthood of our hearts and our lives today, uh, I want us to, to address a popular phrase. It's a phrase you've heard of, probably a phrase you've used. And in order to understand where we're going with what I felt like the Lord was stirring in my heart, I want to revise this phrase. I want to address it, maybe, maybe more so complete it. It's not that it's wrong. How many of you know we say things in, in the church world uh, that have become very popular cliche phrases that are utterly incomplete. Like, for instance, how many of you in this room have received Jesus into your heart? How many of you in this room would agree Jesus died for your sins? Uh, so I know you're, you're, you're watching me. Some of you are raising your hands, and some of you are like, you're giving us trick questions, aren't you? And so what, what's happening is, you know, do you receive Jesus in your heart? Did Jesus die for your sins? Well, those are incomplete expressions that allude to a greater truth. Jesus didn't actually die for your sins, according to the Scripture. He became your sins and died as them on the cross, and they have no longer a hold over you. And when he came back from death to life, he released a power for you to conquer the very thing that killed him on the cross, your sin, and you then have that strength within you. Can I hear an amen on that? God has given us the strength and the power. Unto us this child has come, this obedient servant was born, and he modeled the example of obedience and servanthood that we need to model and pursue ourselves. The phrase that I want us to address and look at today is that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And I'll show you where that's found. It's actually in the book of John, and we'll see how Jesus described this. And again, it's not a wrong phrase. It's just that we've used it in a way that leaves it, renders it incomplete in our perspective. It says uh, in John chapter 17, keep the obedient servant in mind as we look at this, John 17, 14 to 18. I have given them your word. This is Jesus declaring of his disciples. I've given them your word, and the, word, uh, the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. There, there's where we get the idea of this. But let's look at the continuation and the context of this. Verse 15, very important. I do not ask you to take them out of the world. That is a really important statement for us as Christians to understand. I didn't ask you to take them out. But keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. So all of this groundwork of Scripture, this is the thing that I want you to understand. One glad morning when this life is o'er. I'll fly away. We've sung about this. We've celebrated this. We've taken people and introduced them to Christ. And then we've told them in the church world, now stay away from the bad people in the world because you're Christians and you don't affiliate and you don't associate with darkness in that regard. And by the way, we're going to have revival services and we want you to invite all your lost friends to come to the revival services. But the problem is we told you not to have any lost friends. And so it really has rendered us as a church very ineffective in the, in the modern day ideology of the body of Christ. So in the world, not of the world, kind of leaves us in a perspective where we're looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ as an extraction from the world, but actually the gospel of Jesus Christ is about an invasion to the world where the kingdom of God is here. Listen, if Daniel can walk through the lion's den and not be scathed, I think you can handle being around the people that you work with in a way that develops a relationship to introduce them to the love and the life of Jesus Christ. We just want to understand what Jesus really means by this. And so breaking it down a little bit for us to understand, Jesus' statement in this is more of a commission than it is a conclusion. He's making a statement of commission rather than conclusion, a statement of invasion rather than a statement of extraction. He's not huddling up the team Come on, disciples, let's huddle up for another round of kumbaya. What he's doing is huddling up the team to make sure we understand what the ball is and whose possession, what the goal is, and we're about to break through enemy territory and run this ball down the field, and we are going to make some progress, and the kingdom of God is going to expand, and people that are blinded by darkness will be awakened to the light, and by the way, when somebody's in darkness and suddenly the lights come on, don't expect them just to always be happy. They might have a reaction, but you just keep being the light. Your job's not to change anybody. Your job is to love everybody. That's 
what God has called us to do. Keep on loving. Let God do the changing, and you just keep on loving. Unto us a child is born. This obedient servant has come, and he's awakened this obedient service within our hearts to reach the people that are surrounding us in our everyday lives. Those are the people God has entrusted to your care. He's entrusted those people to your care. We, following his example, are sent as obedient servants into the world. Our main emphasis is not to disassociate from the world. Our main emphasis is actually to enter into the world and be protected from the evil one, as Jesus prayed, and be effective with our assignment right in the midst of every circumstance into which we walk. We are anointed by God to make a difference in the lives of those around us. So it is important that you and I be awakened to His truth on an ongoing basis, awakened to His truth. God wants to awaken His truth in our lives. Uh, we need to learn to live inspired lives. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate, Jesus didn't come to establish a holiday. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion. In fact, religion, by and large, attacks the very nature of God revealed uh, in the body of Christ, and we have to be very guarded against this. And when I start talking like this, sometimes people, they, you know, like I've been introduced in some of our community events as a religious leader in the community, and, and I understand where they're coming from, and it, it's kind of a shame that we've allowed the, the idea of religion to be all negative because it's really not. There is a good religion the Bible references, but it's the religion that actually embraces the nature of Christ as opposed to the religion that crucified Christ in the first place. Do you follow me? And so we need to understand there is a religious ideology that tries to creep into modern day Christians that actually attacks the nature of God. That's the very thing that will cause you never to smile because you've become so uptight about everything going on that you walk around looking spiritually constipated and everybody around you has no desire to have anything that you're carrying from heaven. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being awakened to the joy of the Lord that becomes your strength. Unto us, this child has come. He's a servant. He's obedient to the Lord and serves God and serves the needs of those around him. That's exactly what God's desiring for us to do. You and I are fully capable of deceiving ourselves and sabotaging our own lives. Listen carefully. We are fully capable of deceiving ourselves and sabotaging our own lives with religion at the origin and motivation of those decisions. Do you understand that? Do you understand reading your Bible is pretty important? And we talk about the turn the page challenge often, and I want to reiterate it anytime I can, but don't let reading your Bible become an idol in your life. Don't become prideful about how much you read your Bible or reading your Bible, you've missed the point. You understand it's not about reading the book, it's about sitting with the author. It's about embracing the nature of God and letting him awaken something by his spirit in your life. Stay the course in scripture. Every day, turn the page because it's key that you get this and it's your next blank. There are deep, elaborate complexities driving our perspectives, decisions, and conclusions. How many of you know there's a lot of complex stuff going on inside you right now? This is why we desperately need to invite God's thoughts into our everyday lives in places of prayer and reading God's Word. So I would invite you to make it a point to stay before the Lord in a way that every day in your old-fashioned Bible, you start in the book of Genesis, put the date at the top of the page, turn the page, and just journal, commemorate specific days and events, and you have this wonderful heirloom that you leave as a legacy to your children, impacting them and your children's children and generations you'll never see by an heirloom of your faith that you place in their hands. How many of you know I say that a lot? You hear me say it a lot. Well, I hope that you'll really embrace the, the power of that tool, not just in your life, but in the lives of those who come after you. Our mission, I just want you to understand our mission. Jesus set the example as an obedient servant. Our mission is not only to be free. Our mission is to be freedom fighters. We're not trying to get people uh, extracted out. We're trying to get people effectively inundated in, equipped as the army God's called us to be, sharing the love and the life of Christ everywhere we've gone. I'll say it this way. We've not merely been rescued from darkness. We've been given the light. I just want you to think about that for a moment. You've not merely been rescued from darkness. You've truly 
been given God's light, and you carry that light. Have you ever lit a match in a, in, in a dark uh, room or, or at night somewhere, and anybody around within visibility of that light, once it burns, they are glued to the light. In darkness, light captures attention. And then if you will take uh, two matches and put them together, it multiplies that light. And, and I just want to make the point, and it's important that you understand and that we hear this, uh, your mission in your life. How many of you know you have a mission from God? The Great Commission really defines your mission, and it defines it in your own way. I actually said this at our 9 o'clock prayer uh, gathering as we come together, all of our servant leaders that are serving for the day. We come in for a rally, morning focal point, and I, and I share this, and I just want to make, I want to make this very clear, because today, this can, almost where I'm going to go with you, uh, it can be confusing if you're not careful. You'll start trying to really live up to the standard of somebody else that you see who's really doing it right. And a, a lot of confusion in the church today is really born from the idea, are, are you with me today to get this, because you really need to hear this is, this is going to unlock something for you. A lot of confusion in the body of Christ today is born from the idea of somebody who does something effective for the things of, for the Lord, uh, the things of God are applied in their lives, and then we see that and we think, well, I should be more like that. You know, I should be inspired by people who are effective in their faith, but I shouldn't be more like them. I have an assignment. You have an assignment, and it's uniquely you. And the problem in the religious circles of modern day today is we're trying to fit people into molds that they don't fit into, and so it frustrates them, and it steals their joy. It robs them of all the characters of the king that God wants to be the characteristics of our lives because we'll never live up to being who somebody else is because you are you. You are not them. You'll never be a good version of them. You'll be the best version of you if you'll discover who God's called you to be. And you need, to, you need to discover that and walk that out as an obedient servant. An obedient servant, fulfilling the plans of God. Your mission requires the closest connections in your life to be filled with God's light. I want to make sure I bring full context to what I'm saying. We don't want extraction. We do want invasion. But listen loud, hear me loud and clear. Your closest comrades, your, Jesus set this example. He surrounded himself with disciples that were hungry for the heart of the Father. And he awakened that in them, and they awakened that back. There was this reciprocation, the strength that comes. Your closest allies in your life need to be people who are filled with God's light. I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of friends with a lot of uh, ideas and a lot of attitudes uh, and sometimes I'm in circles of conversation and interaction with language that doesn't sound like my language and jokes sometimes that don't sound like my jokes, and I'm not offended by that. I understand that's just where people are. I'm just going to keep being me and let God do what God wants to do, but I'm not going to fill my mind with those things as my most prevailing relationships that exist in my life. I want the closest people around me to be people that are full of the light of God. This is important that we understand that so that we can truly fulfill everything God's called us to fulfill. So now, the fulfillment, this is interesting because unto us this child is born, the obedient servant has come, and then you and I are actually the fulfillment of the prophecy in the latter part of the book of Isaiah. So as we follow his example as an obedient servant, we fulfill our mission and our commission as obedient servants as well. And I want to read that portion of Scripture. I'm going to read it every week. I'm going to read the first part in Isaiah, and I'm going to read this portion in Isaiah. All four of these weeks from these different perspectives today, I want you to hear it from the perspective of you and I being obedient servants. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, you, us, obedient servants, because the Lord has anointed us to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent us to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Are you hearing your assignment today? To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide to those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. We're reversing the curse in Jesus' mighty name. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness. How many of you have been reached by the love of Jesus Christ? You then are called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore places 
houses long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. You and I have a very important role to play, a life to live, and to give everything God's called us to give in our world to reverse the curse and declare no matter what the ruin is, God is able to bring it out of devastation. And that happens in our everyday lives. The kingdom of God is at hand. Life's greatest treasures are within your reach. Who are the people God has entrusted to your care? And how are you obeying God and serving them to walk this thing out? That's what will change the world. And it looks different in each person's life. How many of you are talkers? Raise your hand if you're a talker. How many of you are huggers? Raise your hand if you're a hugger. How many of you are not a hugger? I am a talker and a hugger. And I think everybody should be like Jesus. (laughs) And isn't it funny how we tend to create God in our own image? And it turns out he loves all the people you love and hates all the people you hate when you've created God in your own image. And the fact is, we're incomplete without each other. We bring perspective and context to each other's lives. It's why community is so necessary, and it's why we understand and recognize God has not called me to be you or you to be me, but our uniqueness and our distinction is actually what makes us complete. And a very important phrase, you'll hear me say this often, as a part of our church family, I want you to hear loud and clear. We can have distinction without having division if we're willing to embrace each other in the love of Christ. Not everybody here is going to worship the same way. Some people are going to be very expressive in their worship. Some people here are not. You can have distinction without having division if you won't be judgmental about what you see or don't see. I don't know why they don't lift their hands and never lift their hands. You don't know what's going on in their heart. I don't know why they have to bounce around turn in circles all the time. You understand, you don't know what's going on in a person's heart. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what they've come out of. So let's not put labels on people. Let's embrace each other and let God have his way and the body of Christ be the body of Christ. Come on, we can have distinction. So what's your assignment? What does your assignment look like? I want to tell you a story. And this is a really inspiring assignment. And you have to be careful because you don't align yourself with somebody else's assignment, you discover your own. So let this inspire you to discover your assignment rather than to confuse you to think this assignment becomes yours. This is a little baby girl who was born in India and she was in an orphanage. There was a ministry organization who found this little girl in the orphanage knowing that she was severely disabled And without surgeries, she didn't stand a chance. She had to have surgeries in order to walk, and she had to have surgeries in order to talk. So this organization actually provided for these surgeries to hopefully rescue this little girl that would have just been abandoned and spent her life uh, in an orphanage with no hope, no family, no love, no exchange taking place. The little girl I'm talking about actually attends our church now. She's moved from India to Oklahoma City, and her name is Darnie Danley. Say that three times fast. <laughs> Darnie Danley, and she's under construction, you can see. Sweet, sweet Darnie. Uh, she's been here now with us uh, for just a matter of months, actually, and um, God has really had his hand on her from the very beginning. Jay and Jen Danley on the third row here. Um, were they actually, if I understand correctly, were on a missions trip. I've just been stalking them online. They didn't know I was going to do this today. I've been extracting pictures and kind of developing the story, talking to them inadvertently for a few weeks to make sure I had most of the details right. But on a missions trip, uh, God really birthed something in their hearts that they would bring the mission home to the most intimate place of their lives by adopting a child. So Jay, Jen, and their son Callum went on a trip to India after they had been accepted uh, as adopting parents, and there they all are coming home from India back to Oklahoma City as they uh, became a family, and Callum became a wonderful big brother. 
This Thanksgiving, they posted uh, a tale of two Thanksgivings, and it shows their acceptance last year and then their new family this year. And look at her smile. Isn't that just amazing? I just love it. So beautiful. And Darnie's life has uh, completely changed in so many ways. I've, I've watched them post when she saw her first snow and caught her first snowflake on her tongue, and then it was very cold. She did not want to stay out there any longer. She came in the house. But uh, her first big birthday cake. And, uh, you know, here's the thing I just want to say. I'm not sure what modern-day superheroes look like, but I'm thinking this family might be a pretty good example of exactly that. And I want to say to you, uh, Dan always, thank you for challenging the rest of us to the core to learn what it is to really follow the example, of, the sacrificial example of Christ, just to obey. You know, it was, it was not, it, you just have to understand, the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. You, you need to get this. We need to get this as the church. Because we so focus on being so sacrificial on behalf of God, you, you understand, if you're not careful, you migrate into a religious ideology that then celebrates with arrogance and pride all the sacrifices I've made for him or for, for this church or whatever it may be. But obedience is better than sacrifice. That means don't just run off trying to be you know, the martyr, sacrificial person on behalf of God. Pause, pray. Listen, obey, become an obedient servant. What's God asking you to do? I, I doubt anybody uh, in this room is called by God to travel to India and adopt a child. Maybe somebody is. Maybe this morning that begins to stir in your heart and you want to have a conversation with Jay and Jen about what all that looked like. But that's not the goal in the conversation that we're having here. The goal in the conversation is that we be inspired to press in and listen to what God may have for us so we can be the obedient servants that are literally reversing the curse in the lives of those around us on every level of our existence. A better revision to that common phrase is that we are in the world but not of the world as we have been sent into the world. And understanding our commission to be sent in too keeps us from extracting away as if all these bad people are the problem in our world. Can I just tell you, your complaining is a bigger problem than the bad people in the world. We've got a lot to complain about in the political environment uh, that we're in. Regardless of who you're for or against, there's a lot to complain about. How many of you know? You can, depending on what news network you want to watch, you'll find something to complain about. You know what the biggest problem with the darkness is? Never been the abundance of darkness, always been the absence of light. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, stop complaining, and start praying, use the resource of their voice to pray rather than to complain, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Come on. I'm preaching a pretty good message this morning. That we would awaken to the purposes of God and leave the world a better place, obediently serving His purposes. So I want to give you an opportunity this morning just to make a decision to step forward, whatever that step looks like in your life. But I want to explain something before I do. How many of you are convicted this morning? Can I just see you just raise your hand if you're convicted? Like you need to go deeper. You need to step forward. Don't, don't do this. Like hold them up there. Let's, let's be honest, church. I'm convicted. You know, I, I sense, I, I know God just wants to, wants to do more. And so, so I want you just to reflect on that, but I want to challenge you to know this. Um, I've got some, some people that I've been talking to for our, you know, we're going to do a Christmas Eve service. We're going to do it from 5 to 6. And that way people who celebrate Christmas Eve earlier in the day will be able to do that and be here at 5. Or if they have an evening meal, they can leave at 6. We won't be after 6. It'll be 6 o'clock. And it's going to be a very unique evening. There's going to be a little uh, Trans-Siberian rock and roll unveiling that's going to take place that night. And so it, it, a lot of, lot of elements with all of it. But the reason I'm explaining it to you is it is a wonderful tool of evangelism. And I want you to begin to ponder who God's entrusted to your care that you could actually invite to such a unique service like that. 
It'll be a lot of fun. We're going to have, I think I'm allowed to say gingerbread. I don't know if I'm allowed to say the houses will be in the lobby or not, but cookies. Anyway, uh, a lot of things have been planned, and they normally don't tell me all those things because I do exactly what I just did, and I let the cat out of the bag. <clears throat> but it's just going to be a special evening together. The kids will have a role to play in all of it. It'll be, you know, just an, a wonderful celebration of Jesus and a clear salvation presentation of who Jesus truly is. I mean, you know, he'll change the person's life. And so the thing I want to challenge you as we start to look at this next year, uh, I'm going to unveil the 2019 New Year's Revelation at our servant leader banquet this Wednesday night for everyone who's serving in the church to hear that first and then we'll start bringing an emphasis of that for 2019. And, but I'll, I'll just tell you this, it really deals with our understanding more of what our assignment is truly all about. And 2019 is gonna be that year. 2019, I'm just saying, there are some of your friends and family members who are about to come to Jesus in 2019. They're coming to Christ. Now, how many of you are hoping God will reach your friends and family members? And how many of you know God is hoping you will reach your friends and family members? We're, we're a team. He's the light, we're the light, we partner together in this process. And so what we're going to focus on this next year is an understanding uh, as we're, you know, come into the year will be 90 days to Easter. And I want to ask you to spend the first 30 days, and I'll explain all this as we get a little closer into it, but the first 30 days, I want to ask you just to begin praying for the people, identifying the people God's entrusted to your care. Who, who do you frequent? Restaurants, grocery stores, work, whatever. The people God's entrusted to your care so that you can be loving and be the, the force of God in their lives that God's called you to be. So the first 30 days will be that focus of discovering who those people are, asking God just to speak to your heart. Then the next 30 days, it's a 90-day um, challenge. The, the next 30 days, we want to ask you just to begin to cultivate God's kingdom in those relationships effectively. Intentionally express love, serve, give, however, into those people's lives. Now you've identified these are people God's entrusted in my care. I want to be responsible for those relationships. And then the final 30 days, just ask God to give you an opportunity to have a conversation where you extend an invitation for them to come and to be a part of Easter or events or things that are going on. But you just become a bridge for them to come to know Christ. I just want to say it again. How many know some of your friends and family members are going to come to know Jesus? This is our assignment that we will truly be a part of God's plan to rescue the world. We're, we're serious about the mandate God's placed on our lives. So I want you to kind of put this into practice as you start thinking about our Christmas Eve service and start pondering who's been entrusted to your care and how you might be able to invite them into that. And, and just seek the Lord. Here's your action point. We bring God's presence to real life. That's what we do. So your assignment this week is to pray about your New Year's revelation for 2019. We'll have a church New Year's Revelation, but I want to ask you to have an individual New Year's Revelation. Resolutions are good. Revelations are better. Resolution is what do I want to work on. Revelation, what does God want to reveal? So pursue God and just ask Him to speak to you what your New Year's Revelation is. The reason Revelation is better than resolution is because obedience is better than sacrifice. God will speak. You respond. Come on, let's stand together. sure love my family, love my church family, destiny family, a place where you don't have to have it all together, a place where we understand we're all just on a journey trying to find our way. And every step of the way, God, in His grace and in His love, helps us find the continuation of that path. So Lord, we invite you just to speak to our hearts. Just as we take a moment, just to go back into just a few moments of worship, I want you just to posture your hearts before Him. And what we do in worship, we just bring an expression of what God's deposited within us today, expressing our love back to Him. And Lord, I thank You for the deposits of Your Word. I thank You, Lord, for the deposits of Your Spirit. And I believe that You are establishing a mechanism within us that will actually... Uh, come to fruition and, and help us understand over the course of time more of what you have in store just from deposits Lord that you've made in our hearts today that we would become obedient servants obeying you starting in our relationship with Christ and walking that out as a part of the mission that is assigned to us in Jesus mighty name
Lord, I thank you that you've seen our hands and you know our hearts. We're convicted today. We're convicted to take steps forward and to walk out the plan that you have in store. And I pray, Lord, you would help us to understand what that really looks like in each of our individual lives. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, always begins in every person's life with a prayer of salvation. That's an introductory conversation between them and God. It's not everything that needs to be said. It's just the beginning of what will be said as you launch that. So let's all just pray that today. Would you just say this out loud as we declare the Lordship of Christ together as a family? Everyone say it with me. Say, Lord Jesus, you're the giver of life. You came, you lived, you died, but you're alive. You are who you say you are. You're the savior of the world. I accept. I need you as my savior. Be Lord of my life. Teach me to be an obedient servant following your example. In Jesus' mighty name.